I'm going to break, or at least appear to break, one of the few taboos that still kind of really exist in secular society. Now, I'm not going to talk about <laughs> paedophilia or try and agitate for them. I think that's a lesson that Amos Ye is, is learning, that that's something that you can't do. Um, what I'm going to do is to comment on parenting. I'm going to comment on parenting as someone who doesn't have any children. This is something you just don't do. I'm not actually going to tell anyone how to raise their child, but I have a concern and I'm just going to kind of offer my opinion and you can take it or leave it. A very lovely friend of mine who is very dear to my heart has two very sweet little boys. Um, and seems to be doing a fantastic job of parenting, primarily because she worries so much that she's not necessarily doing a good job of parenting, but from everything that I can see, she's doing a bang-up job. But recently she read Robert Webb's book, How Not To Be A Boy, um, and posted a couple of comments and, and things about it. And you know, it raises terms like patriarchy, or as Webb calls it, the trick, um, and the concept of toxic masculinity. And while I would never tell anyone how to raise their child, this worries me because these ideas are pernicious and can be extremely negative as an impact for boys and for men. And I can't help but worry that someone brought up to think of themselves as part of this patriarchy or to think of masculinity itself as being toxic potentially causes more problems than it perhaps solves. Before you react, please listen to the rest of this video because nuance is a thing. I'm not going to go too deep into these topics, or at least not the patriarchy here, but I'm going to concentrate more on this idea of toxic masculinity and masculinity in general. So there's a couple of problems here with both of these terms. One is that they're used in some ways academically and occasionally with some sort of legitimacy, but when that crosses over into the real world, when it crosses over into media articles or activism, it seems to mean something entirely different. So is there a patriarchy? There are patriarchies. If you look to Islamic countries or some African countries, you know, women are excluded from public life. They're excluded from participation in politics, in certain industries and so on. They must be escorted by men. You know, that is genuinely a, a form of patriarchy where women are excluded, men are uplifted, where under Islamic law, for example, a man's testimony is worth multiple times that of a woman, and, and so on. You know, these are these are examples. Islam's just the one I know best, best to pick on. And in many Western societies, we used to be like that, but we're not anymore. So when you're talking about patriarchies in terms of these societies, yeah, sure, they, they exist. We, we can point to that. When you talk, start talking about the patriarchy, people tend to kind of end up in this unfalsifiable kind of secular substitute for Satan or something. You, know, you, can, you can approach a, a problem from one direction and they'll tell you, oh, well, that's an example of patriarchy. You can approach it from the other direction and they'll tell you that's still patriarchy. It's, it's, it, it's an inescapable, amorphous nonsense. And I think kiriarchy, despite being intended as an extension of patriarchy, describes society better in that we all have interlocking areas in which we might have a slight advantage or disadvantage. Privilege is the wrong term to use semantically, but, but people do. So I don't think there is patriarchy in the West. Men hold the majority of positions still, but they're not closed to women. And some of this may just be down to hormones, genetic proclivities, and these things become harder and harder to separate from societal pressures and so on as we go along. I think I think the lie of the patriarchy capitalized is demonstrated in the phrase, the patriarchy hurts men too. Because if it really was a patriarchy, that would be an oxymoronic statement. Okay, so I don't believe we live in a patriarchy. And what I want 
it's for anyone of either gender of whatever sexuality and so on to have the same equal chance in society to live their lives how they wish and the evidence suggests that there are differentials between how men and how women want to live their lives and the choices that they make don't take that to be biological determinism or anything because these just describe broad genetic tendencies and not individuals everything's on a bell curve it's just the bell curves differ in some significant ways between genders hopefully that's enough of an excuse so right toxic masculinity then toxic masculinity is supposed to describe behaviors that are more, more common or are definitional to men that are bad bad for society and bad for men bad for women bad for everybody that's the kind of thing it's supposed to mean and from that we could certainly also point to behaviors that are more common to women that are more toxic people don't tend to but i think we can all agree that there's an extent to which feminine coded behaviors can also be detrimental the trouble is that this term toxic masculinity is used to attack any form of goodness in, in, in masculinity any form of masculine coded behavior whatsoever is labeled as toxic masculinity this may not be the intent but it is how it ends up it's how it's used and if a word or a term is defined by its usage then the term toxic masculinity is very negative and used to relentlessly attack men, male tendencies, male behaviours and so on. So you know, there is an issue there. I prefer to interpret it somewhat differently. I prefer to interpret it as male coded behaviours taken to extremes and I see the same problem on, on women's side with feminine coded behaviors taken to extremes being bad so let's draw on a couple of examples from Webb's book some of the rules for being a man that he talks about under the title um, these are examples of what he considers to be toxic masculinity so there's don't cry love sport play rough drink beer don't talk about feelings and these are presented as being necessarily negative necessarily toxic and taken to extremes they certainly can be I mean a man who completely bottles up his feelings doesn't talk about them never cries about something that hurts him you know that ends up being turned inward and it's probably part of what accounts for the high suicide rate amongst men but men aren't women and approaches that attack men's issues around mental health and emotional well-being and so on that treat them like broken women don't tend to be useful whereas approaches that understand masculinity and try to approach these issues from a, from a more male perspective such as the men's sheds movement they tend to be much more effective you know, we are different as a, as a gender it's unfashionable to point that out it's certainly unfashionable to try and cater to men's needs directly and as a result men are dying but there is something to be said for showing your emotions and crying and there's also a negative side to being too emotional to crying all the time you know when you're in a crisis when there's a, a big problem or an issue going on you want someone who is able to push down their feelings overcome move through and deal with it and that is the healthy side of, of, of that aspect so stoicism uh, being able to put your feelings aside is valuable so long as it's not taken to an extreme but the way in which this is approached is as though you know as, as though this stoicism as, as though being able to cope is somehow bad um, I use the phrase too much of, of the baby being thrown out with the bathwater but this is what happens when they talk about toxic masculinity love sport now this is something alien to me but there is a good side to loving sport if you do love sport you have the camaraderie you have a leisure activity a, a hobby something you can focus on something you can talk about with others it's good for networking and, and discussing and, and so on and if, if you play it you know that gives you team building exercises and for a lot of boys 
especially young boys, they have a lot of energy. And sport is a harmless means to, to focus and use that energy and to harness those kind of natural competitiveness that seems to be more common in boys. So it's not necessarily bad, but taken to an extreme, there's that over high level of, of competitiveness and, and, and viciousness and, and go-getting sort of attitude that can be genuinely toxic. So again, there's a good side to that and there's an extreme that becomes bad. Same with playing rough. I mean, that's how you learn resilience it's how you learn the limits of your body, how to play around without hurting someone. And then taken to a, an extreme again, it can become bullying, it can become violence. But there's a good side to it as well, again, the, the extraction of that energy and so on. Uh, drinking, again, there's a, there's a good side to that, the social side, the camaraderie, the loosening up, the way that drinking enables a man who might otherwise be too pent up to cry, to share his feelings uh, in a context in which everyone can say, oh, it was just the beer talking, you know? Taken to an extreme, it's alcoholism. So I think you can see in all these instances that things that he's writing off and saying are necessarily toxic and, and bad don't have to be that. It's when they're taken to an extreme. And you can say the same about femininity, feminine aspects. I mean, to take one example, the caring, nurturing side that we tend to code as being as being female, as being feminine. If you take that to an extreme, it becomes coddling, it becomes smothering. People grow up, kids grow up with no resilience to the world around them, not knowing how to cope with anything. And so that can have a negative impact. And it can also have a negative impact on the woman because she may always want and need someone else to do things for her and that has a negative impact on your life so I, I, I think we can see that no one would say that caring and nurturing is, is bad is it's toxic is toxic femininity but again taken to that extreme it can be stoicism is something that can be good it's only bad when it's taken to this utter extreme I'll wrap this up fairly quickly because I know people don't have patience for the longer videos. This is purely anecdotal, but again, most of this kind of research is, is pretty anecdotal or not replicable, so I, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I was a fairly effete little boy. I liked to read, I didn't like sport, I would much rather sit at home with a book than go out and play five a side or whatever. I did enjoy going out in the woods with the boys, building dens and running around, you know, playing war, stuff like that, imaginative games. But otherwise, you know, I wasn't super masculine in a way that a lot of other people were. I managed to find a way to be masculine through the application of my intelligence. Um, and later on through sexuality, uh, which I felt made me quite masculine, um, though I was always very solicitous and overly cautious perhaps, but I still felt that my strong sense of my personal sexuality was, was something that made me feel more male. Um, and the other big thing in my life that has made me feel masculine has been stoicism. Now I've had that experience both at a, a very positive level and at the negative toxic level. So for much of my life in school I was horrendously bullied. I didn't particularly fit in with the in crowd. I was off to the side with the weirdos, freaks and nerds and didn't necessarily quite fit with a lot of them per se either. I was caught in this kind of half world between between the two spheres and yeah I was horrendously bullied I there were things I didn't I didn't really enjoy school even though I was pretty good at the subject and the only way to get through that was to be stoic was to say I can take anything to throw up the the emotional armor and let it just bounce off and that was how I managed to cope and deal with a lot of it um, and this carried on into, into my teens and into my early 20s. Oh, when my parents divorced, you know, that stoicism helped me through. And it's only later on that it really started to get to the point of being toxic, where I felt that I couldn't open up 
that I was some sort of emotionless robot. I couldn't open up about my feelings to to anybody, or it would all come rushing out, and everything that I'd I'd kind of pinned so much on being stoic, on being able to take anything, that letting that go was virtually impossible for a lot of time, and that contributed to my suicidal ideation and so on, because that was the only outlet that was left for all this shit that I had been bottling up and just dealing with by myself for so long. So I've seen both sides of, of, of that there. So when it comes to masculinity, I worry that the, the positive sides of these things is being lost in this kind of rush to condemn masculinity as a whole, as though it is necessarily and inherently bad in some way, when all of these things I can see the positives to, even things that I didn't do, are what I would like to see, rather than this condemnation and damnation of, of masculinity, is more of an emphasis on the, the positive sides of these things, and that how they can go wrong. So, you know, being able to endure is good, taking it to the point where you can no longer open up to anyone is bad. You know, when you can't cope, you know, find someone that sort of thing. I want to see the, the doors of masculinity and femininity thrown open so that you can be a man in a broader amount of ways, you can be a woman in a broader amount of ways. I'm worried that what's going to happen to men is somewhat similar to what's happened with feminism in that in seeking to broaden and widen the definition of what it is to be a woman, what it is to be feminine, those women who choose a more traditional expression of their femininity end up being condemned and marginalized in exactly the way that the women who used to rebel against those standards used to be marginalized and abused. And if all we do is we kind of swap polarities and we condemn people the way they used to condemn us, like the way they used to condemn effeminate men or the, the way they used to condemn masculine women, then we haven't solved a problem, we've just swapped it around. So, I guess all I can say is I would implore anyone uh, with little boys or little girls to just enable them to be the best of them that they can be and not to allow these kind of agendas to twist up your kids um, and condemn them for who they choose to be when they should be empowered to be who they choose to be so long as it doesn't get to the level of being toxic. I hope that made sense. Zang. Shine is on me like a dog on a what? Oh. Fight the power, put myself on the throne. You know when shit is getting heavy like it weighs a ton. Uh -huh. I will run you down like a marathon. Uh -huh. Take you up good, put you in the trunk. See you next Tuesday, you was a punk. Well, my daddy left home when I was three and he didn't leave much for Ma and me. Just this old guitar and an empty bottle of booze. Now, I don't blame him because he run and hid, but the meanest thing that he ever did was before he left, he went and named me Sue. <laughs>